Before I start with this panel, I want to turn back to the audience. And Tom, that was a great introduction. And you showed us that there's really differences in aging um, across countries and regions of the world. So to all of you, I'm going to ask for a show of hands. And I'd like you to think, in 100 years from now, in any region, we're all coming from many different parts of the world. So think about it from your perspective of where you come from. Do you think that the average life expectancy will increase by 10 years more from where you're at today in your respective country? If so, hands up. A lot of hands up. Now, if you think it will increase by 20 years, keep your hand up. Huh? Okay, still hands up. 30 years? A few. How many think your life expectancy will go down? Anybody there? All right, so we're, we're optimistic that our life expectancy is gonna, gonna overall go up. A few of us think it won't, but um, so the thoughts that we wanna consider here is how humans might change in the future, both naturally and by our own intervention. And um, we don't have to confine the discussion to humans. We can think of other life forms as well, and Adam challenged us with that. And so how, so how will the living world around us change? And I'm gonna maybe start with you because you've spent a lot of time thinking about directed um, evolution. Um, what are your thoughts about how we're going to evolve? It turns out evolution is the most powerful design process ever invented. Humans think they're good at design, but there is nothing like evolution for solving problems. And I'll tell you, the most complex things on the planet, the microbes in your gut, for example, are solving problems all the time dealing with our antibiotics and resistance to our pesticides. So when it comes to evolution, I think we can look at the rest of the living world. And I'd like to make one point. We talk about human longevity, but we are part of the internet of living things, right? We talk about the internet of things, but the internet of living things is transferring genetic material and problem sol solving in real time. So I think that thinking just about how a human and our own genome will evolve is way too narrow uh, a view. Okay. All right. Uh, the information flow is a big one as well. I think we'll come back to that topic because we're getting a lot of inputs as we go forward. Um, you talked a lot about cells, Paul. Is there a definitive number of how many times our cells are going to divide just before they you know, peter out? Well, the, the, there is. There's the so-called famous Hayflick limit. Um, whether it quite works like that, I don't know, but um, really. But um, it is thought that there could be a natural restraint on the numbers of time cells divide, and that might contribute to aspects of, of aging. But I, I wanted to say something else, if I could take it in a um, somewhat... Um, well, actually, it was a thought I had over lunch, I'll be perfectly honest with you. <laughs> and I was just trying to think what we meant Was it during the dessert or was it during the main <laughs> course? It was my lunch, so and I had okay. a very interesting lunch, and it suddenly occurred to me, I didn't know what we meant by evolution in this context. And so um, I thought a bit about it, because, and it might be helpful just to sort of categorise that, because... Uh, um, we start, of course, uh, thinking of you know evolution, natural selection, Darwin, all that sort of stuff. But actually, it's a bit more complex than that in this instance, I would say. So one is, I think we should make a distinction between what I call um, social evolution. That is evolution of societies and communities and ideas, which are actually um, uh, independent of us as individual organisms, but are the consequence of being a community, sharing knowledge, sharing what could be, in an ideal word, the common good. And that, I think, is probably the major driving force at this time for advancement for humankind. Then I thought, secondly, right, but um, we can also um, correct problems, and I think that's where we were sort of going, you know, diseases and so on, with sort of technologies. You know, we're wearing spectacles. This is a correction of a defect. We have hearing aids, or, or I should have a hearing aid I'm discovering as I get older. And these are, if you like, replacement of things that are going wrong, which we sort of take for granted, but are actually enhancement, and there may be more of those sorts of things, and naturally we then get into corrective medicine and so on as well. Um, then there is the evolving of capabilities which are beyond the normal. Uh, 
in a sense, the motor car is beyond the normal. In a sense, a telescope is beyond the normal. You see where I'm going. That in fact, you can, is it the word enhance? I'm not sure it's always enhancing, but certainly it's changing our um, capability. And then only after all of that do we get into evolution as we think about it as changing our genetic composition, which could be somatic, which is probably what you were referring to. That is changing the genes of our bodies, which could be used to correct disease and so on, and more radically to change the genes of the germline, mm -hmm. which could, of course, um, in a very direct way, change evolution. And that is complicated, partly morally, partly ethical, and partly because we are so ignorant, really, about the consequences of how changing things in the human genome will have um, uh, effects. Where we have monogenic disease with clarity, it's straightforward but many other things are not. Now, I know I've divided the cake up into a sort of variety of different ways between <laughs> lunch and now, but I just thought that evolution um, can fit into a, a variety of but those categories. But don't you know it was the microbes that were telling you what you were going to say here because it was happening at lunch. Without doubt. <laughs> it might Without have been that. The, the microbes were speaking to you. And, uh, but, you know, Birgit, you were nodding when you talked about this social evolution, um, you know, the idea of society as well, and you also had the comment about making corrections, you know, and there's how much of this should we correct? Um, so I don't know if you want to comment on that at all, but you know, you have, your life has changed, you told us the story, and you're in a situation where you're dependent upon other um, devices to help you move around. Um, how much of this change is good, and how much of this change should we embrace? I think that there's going to be uh, really mind-blowing opportunities um, to, like you were saying, to correct things that have gone wrong. Um, in the sports world where I'm uh, working as an athlete, uh, we, we just recently had the, a discussion, you know, in the Paralympic Games, uh, there was a guy who had amputated his legs and he had prosthesis, and he wanted to be a part of the Olympic Games. And people were very skeptic to it because his blades had um, better jumping, uh, they could jump better and run faster than normal legs. So it's an example on how you can actually not only correct or, or substitute what was there before, but actually make something which is making your body even greater. Um, what you can now do with spinal cord injuries, this is just still in testing, but it's, it's possible, you can actually put an implant into the spinal cord and you can have a box on your head that they're putting on your brain, and you can, if I, like I told you earlier, how do you lift a leg? Well, you just do it. But now you can think, well, lift the right leg, and, and the brain will tell this box, who will tell the implant in your spinal cord, and the leg will lift. <laughs> so you're kind of hacking the body, and biohacking it by putting a technical device inside the body, making it uh, do what you want it to do. And I think this is a really interesting uh, development mm. because then you can kind of mm. get actually human and machines mm. starting to work together to make the ability even better. Maybe you're going to run 100 kilometers with that technology. You know? it's Probably even more. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Tom, you wanted to jump in. Yeah, I just wanted to connect a little bit what Paul was saying, with which I completely agree with what Francis said at mm -hmm. the beginning. In a way, you could summarize what you were saying, Paul, is saying that we have evolved the capacity to change our lives and change our world. Mm. Um, but as Francis said, evolution is very elegant and very smart. It's found clever ways of doing things. If we are trying to drive that process and take take change into our own hands, we've got to be very careful because we, we are not constrained in the same kind of way. I think we also need to recognize that evolution, which we see as being generally a force for good, is not totally benign. After all, what I was saying was that evolution has given us aging. Evolution also gave us the COVID pandemic uh, and it's done some pretty unpleasant things in biology. So it's just really a question of trying to feel our way towards getting the balance right with the new powers that are available to us, but to couple that with a degree of humility in relationship to the evolutionary legacy that has brought us to this point. I think you wanted to respond to that. Well, it, it, I think 
we should all realize that we've been driving evolution ever since we've been on this planet, yeah. right? And the vast impact that we have had on biodiversity and, and on the planet can be seen from space, as we heard this morning. Yeah. And that's um, something that we really don't take into account when we think about biohacking or when we think about changing our germline, is that we are part of a much bigger network of life and part of a network that we don't fully understand the mm. impacts that we're having. That's really important. Can I just emphasize, I touched upon that in the opening talk I gave, that we are all a vast interacting ecosystem mm -hmm. and it's hard enough understanding us, understanding us in the entirety of the biosphere. This is scary mm -hmm. stuff, as you're implying. It isn't stuff that we should not think about and be careful of, but we really do have to be careful. Well, it's scary because it's unknown, but it's going to happen, right? And and maybe if we scary understand... Scary in the sense that we shouldn't be arrogant that we know what we're doing. We tread with caution, that's all I meant, yeah. Just you made me think, how much of this needs to be policed, for lack of a better word? You know, there's going to be a lot of changes and there's a lot of things happening, a lot of players involved. Um, and you even have people with laboratories in their own homes today, if you take about the biological perspective. Um, and you talked about the hacking as well. So how much of this should be policed? Well, wait, wait a minute, policing. I mean, when you wash your hands with antibacterial soap, you're driving evolution. When you breed poodles, you're making biological objects that would not exist, that are not even biologically fit, right? If they got out in Los Angeles, they'd be eaten by coyotes. So <laughs> we are making biological entities with old fashioned methods. Now we have powerful new methods. And in fact, this morning's discussion, what is life? We might see a new origin of life in the 21st century mm -hmm. if some of our colleagues who are working on that are mm -hmm. successful. So this is, not, this is not being policed. How do you police it? That's a really, really complicated thing. But the, we're just practicing we're just doing it. it. We're just doing we're it. We're just doing it. And we're doing it fast. We're we had doing a discussion over fast. lunch of how fast this is going. Um, and many of us don't even appreciate that speed. Do you want to comment on that speed of change? Well, every day in the laboratory, we are evolving new proteins that take on functions that nature has never explored before because we can decouple using these methods, the genetic material from the fitness of the organism that makes it. So you can make the essentially the poodle of the molecular life. You can make things that make carbon silicon bonds or carbon boron bonds that were never before explored in natural chemistry. And that's thrilling, right? Because we can think about using life to work with this internet of things. But it's scary because we don't really know what the rules are. We don't know, you know where it can go. You're, good. You're nodding here? <laughs> Yeah, I think this is, uh, yeah, the rules is going to be pushed, I think, all the way. And, uh, well, again, to, see, to look at the, my field, which is sports, it's all about, you know, maximizing the capacity of the human body. That's what you're working with all the time, pushing limits, pushing limits, pushing limits. And uh, athletes are now, you know, walking around with these um, little devices that are telling you how your blood sugar is. That was meant to be for uh, people with diabetes, just because they want to read their body so they can optimize the use of it and also manipulate it into working as much as you want it to. Uh, one of the things that we are discussing is, you know, genetical doping. Well, doping, like the, there's lots of athletes who are willing to make choices who are directly harmful for their body to make them perform mm -hmm the most um, they can. Uh, but when you can start engineer humans to, to perform on an extraordinary level, um, there are drivers like that feel, you know, that want to do that because you want to break limits all the time. And what you're seeing, like us with, with the opinion, you know, we might be able to put aside your values to, because you're so set on this performance. And, um, I think that some places you see this more than others. So we, we need not to be naive about this. People will push it. But yeah. I thought that was going to move to the virtual world. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that Tom, would be jump exciting. in. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Go ahead, Tom, jump in. I, I was just struck when you were saying about athletes pushing limits, pushing limits, pushing limits. 
This, of course, is what older people are doing at the moment now. They're pushing limits, pushing limits, pushing limits. <laughs> people often ask me, is there a limit to how long humans can live? And I say, well, think about running the 1,500 meters. Is there a limit? Athletes are pushing the world record all the time. So the processes are the same. There's a really important connection to be made here, and it applies to things like physical activity and exercise for older people. One of the sad things about getting older is that you lose muscle mass. And when you lose muscle mass, everyday activities, even something as basic as rising from the toilet, becomes very difficult and limiting. So for a 95-year-old, the effort required to rise from the toilet with the residual muscle that remains to them is rather similar to that of an Olympic or a Paralympic athlete competing in a World Games. <laughs> <laughs> and it, it, it just means we, sh we should be really thinking to plan and prepare for the challenges that will come in old age and to regard them in the same spirit that you've just articulated so nicely. I'll remember that tomorrow morning after breakfast. <laughs> that'll, be, yeah, that'll be tomorrow after lunch. Francis, jump in. But what I'm worried about with these discussions, really human-centric focused, is that only a few of us will benefit from these things because the rest of us will be living in a vastly degraded world where reaching our longevity mm -hmm. is not available. Yeah, well, that's actually the next thing I wanted yeah. to discuss is how will the world around us change? You know, I mean, there's one thing about our physiological robustness, but you mentioned the world around us and, you know, aids to get out of the toilet, but how do you think the world around us is going to change as well? I mean, I think young children today are never even going to need to learn to drive a car, right? They will be living in a future where it will be quite different, and they'll have a lot of aids that will enable them um, as well. But you mentioned a bit of this in your, your well, list. I, I, I would go back to um, the community, the social community. I, I think um, we do have the capability of improving lives, but we shouldn't be improving some lives at the expense of other lives. So this requires a new thinking about society as a whole that allows um, the benefits of our knowledge to be distributed and also to benefit as many as possible. We may Worldwide, I think you mean as well. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And um, I mean, we have seen benefits in the past, and though not always they're seen that way. Look at the agricultural revolution, which is genetic engineering of a primitive way where you select plants, totally changed our diet and we had to adapt to that. But it did lead to um, well, what some would say a, a communal advance and our society changed to actually deal with it. Urbanization, which led then to viral diseases and other infectious diseases as well. But somehow we've got to be more adept as a community and society for handling these things. And I think this is something we may talk a bit about later in the day. Mm -hmm. well, but we share the atmosphere. Uh, some of us might get to go to Mars, but I doubt it, right? Yeah. And that's not a plan B, right? So we, we share the atmosphere, we share the oceans, we share so much that we are losing. And so the real question is how do we evolve within this, these constraints and not uh, do ourselves in before you have a chance to figure out how to get up off the toilet, right? <laughs> Barry? Yeah, you just got me thinking about something when you said that about self-driving cars, that yeah, for the, maybe the kids growing up today, they don't have to learn how to drive a car, which is nice for them, it's practical, but imagine people who cannot see who are now don't have the ability to drive a car and suddenly they will be able to uh, man, uh, use a car themselves without being dependent on others. The, there's so many options also for technology and for evolution uh, that's going to make life easier for most of us and much freer for some of us. It's like vibrating phones, right? It's, it's nice to have the phone in your pocket and you can feel it, it's ringing, but for someone who can't hear and don't have the option of having the sound off and, and can't um, see that the phone is ringing, it's essential to actually capture the phone that someone's trying to get a hold of you. So the kind of uh, development that makes people more equal and people function more and use themselves better into a whole, that's the kind of, um, well, you can go from having a disability to actually be equal mm -hmm. because the disability is equalized because you don't need to use that ability anymore. Yeah. And that's, that might mean a lot for those people. 
You know, Francis and I talked a bit on the side topic of diversity and inclusion as well, and how that we can take that on board as we think about evolution. Mm -hmm. Any thoughts from your perspective? Well, any evolutionist knows that all solutions come from diversity, right? You never know which genetic material is going to pop up with the answer, and you never know uh, who on a multidisciplinary team will have the connections, right? So diversity is a sine qua non of, of problem solving in a complex world. You, you <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> listening, listening to what you said made me think of something else. You know, self-driving cars, we don't have to drive. And then I was thinking, yes, we can use all this automation to do many things that we now no longer need to do. Mm. Then the question is whether that makes it a less satisfying life, actually. I mean, the, You'd like the, to drive. The, I mean, driving is <laughs> rubbish. I don't drive. But I do fly gliders, actually. That's a hobby okay. of mine. And the joy of it is just controlling it. I mean, if it was all controlled by a computer, there'd be no point in doing it. I'd not actually, until you mentioned that, I hadn't sort of thought about it, that actually the technology may take us to a point where our lives are less satisfying as a yeah. consequence. I suspect Tom Too has, though, easy, but huh? <laughs> well, Tom wants to jump in here. I think you've thought about this. Yeah, I, I mean, I think what worries me about the, some of the trends that we see into the future is that we're going to lose skills. Also, the kind of technology in the kind of optimistic, the utopian outcome, it will equalise things, but it also runs the risk of making things less equal because social inequality has got so much worse in recent decades in so many countries around the world. I, I happen to live in a rural area. I live in an old farm and we have 50 acres in the UK system of measurement of land that we've been busily rewilding. And I'm required to do an awful lot of maintenance and I have no background or skills in that area. <laughs> and what I find is the opportunity to learn practical skills is a great part of life. And I see in the, in the community around mm -hmm a desire to take back ownership of repair. You know, so we have a very popular television program in the UK called The Repair Shop, <laughs> but we also see in communities now setting up repair cafes. We've been encouraged to become consumers, to throw things away when they no longer mm -hmm. function as we want them. And I think we have to embrace a world in which we, 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 we welcome diversity. We also welcome the opportunity not to be enslaved to the consumerist society, because I think it's very important for enhancing our potentiality, enhancing our self-esteem, enhancing our sense of being, you know, we may suffer physical you know, challenges and limitations, but we still want to exercise as much control as we can over our lives. So I think all of these have to be a part of the mix that we go for in the future. I do want to come back to the social gradient because I think this is something which is truly shocking. Um, it's one of the reasons why uh, in the United States, life expectancy lags behind so many other countries in the world is because there are so many people who do not have the opportunity to live as long and healthily as they might do. And I don't say that with any kind of complacency because the UK is really not much better. We have a great health service free for all at the point of contact. We have education free for all but we see these terrible disparities. And we ran, in, in my institute, we ran an exercise where we tried to war game tackling the social gradient. Our mission was to reduce by half the social gradient within the city of Newcastle in 10 years time with no extra funding. And it was a game, but it was founded on a lot of fact. The winning team didn't get anywhere near meeting the goal, but they got 50% of the way and in the process engaged a lot of people from the disadvantaged sectors of our community, included them in the design, and it was those people who came up with the ways that worked best. So I'm really just underlining the importance of inclusivity and recognising that the interests of those who are not in the front rank of our society should be fully protected and taken into account. I think that's well said, beautifully said. So just to sum up, um, we, I shouldn't be afraid of evolution. It's happening. It's happening fast. It's happening all around us. We should be hopeful. And we should really think about including as many different points of view and um, groups in helping us understand how to sort our way forward with that.
So thank you very much, panel. Thank you. Thank you. Great to meet you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.